Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce the superintendent of VMI, General P. Now, ladies and gentlemen of the VMI Corps of Cadets, cadets and students from V. Will, Mary Baldwin, and Washington Lee, faculty, staff, and guests, welcome. I think we've got a good evening ahead. And we're fortunate to have with us two very experienced leaders who will address the value of mentorship. This discussion comes on the heels, as you know, of a two-day leadership conference on honor in service and the presentation of the fourth uh, Jonathan Daniels Class of 61 Humanitarian Award to Congressman Lewis yesterday. All of these events underscore and advance the leadership and the character development mission of VMI's Center for Leadership and Ethics. A cornerstone initiative of the Center's annual activities is the Leader in Residence Program, through which a current or former leader in government, the military, or in the private sector spends some time with us during the academic spring semester. And during the residency, the leader interacts with cadets, faculty, coaches, staff, our classified team, and others in a variety of formal and informal settings where discussions explore the full range of leadership challenges and issues that that leader has faced. Today's session is the concluding event in this year's program. So with us on the stage this evening are retired U.S. Army Brigadier General Rebecca S. Halstead and retired four-star U.S. Army General James T. Hill. These following uh, introductions uh, this evening are, are going to be a little bit long, but I want you to understand the breadth of their assignments that leads to wisdom in leadership and in decision making. And I think this week, while wonderful presentations that we've had, particularly during the Honors Conference, the recognition of wisdom perhaps could have been more frequently mentioned. These officers have wisdom, thus they have mentorship attained through diver diversified assignments and duties and years and years of service in uniform. General Halstead is serving as this year's leader. She is a 1981 graduate of the United States Military Academy and was the first female graduate of West Point to be promoted to general officer. Her early career as an ordnance officer saw extensive logistical command and staff worldwide, security and training with nuclear weapons in Italy, command of an ordnance company at Fort Lewis, Washington, duty as an assignment staff officer in the personnel business in Washington, aide de camp to the commanding general of Fort Lee, Virginia, battalion staff duty in a Ford support battalion in the 101st Airborne Division at Fort Campbell, duty in the Pentagon, battalion command in the 25th Division in Hawaii, command of the 10th Mountains, division support command at Fort Drum, New York to include its deployment to combat in Afghanistan. And later, General Halstead was a senior commanding general for all logistical operations in Iraq in 2005. And most fittingly, her last duty was commanding general and commandant of the U.S. Army's Ordnance Center at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Maryland, with responsibility for the doctoring, the organization, the equipment development, but I think more importantly, developing and educating young, young ordnance officers for the future. General Halsett has a master's degree in advanced military studies from the Command General Staff College, and she has another master's in natural, national resource strategy from the National Defense University. And upon her retirement after 27 years in the Army, she served first as an executive director for leader development with the pre previous group, and then founded her own leader consultancy company, Steadfast Leadership. She specializes in inspirational speaking, developing leader training programs, leader coaching, consulting, and advising. She is the author of 24-7, The First Person You Must Lead Is You. She served as executive officer to General Hill in 2002 when he was the commander-in-chief of U.S. Southern Command headquartered in Miami, Florida, a close personal relationship that really sets the stage for the discussions this evening. General Hill graduated from Trinity University in San Antonio, Texas in 1968 was commissioned in the U.S. Army as an infantry officer. Among his early assignments from the 101st Airborne Division, Air Mobile, in the Republic of Vietnam as a rifle platoon leader, recon platoon leader, company executive officer, company commander, 
where he was extensively decorated for valor. He has seen duty at Fort Hood, even being detailed to command their historic horse platoon as a youngster, instructed in the Ranger School, and served in the 25th Infantry Division at Schofield Barracks as the S3 Operations Officer with the 1st Battalion, 35th Infantry, and that's where I first met Tom Hill. As a major, while serving in the Pentagon as a staff officer, he was selected as aide-de-camp to the Chief of Staff of the United States Army. At battalion command in the 25th Division, was followed by command of the 1st Brigade, 101st Airborne Division, with wartime duty in Desert Shield and Desert Storm in the first Gulf War in 1990, and then later Chief of Staff of that same division. And as an Assistant Division Commander of the 25th Division, he had major, major duties in Haiti to an operation Uphold Democracy. And along the way, he served in the Pentagon in the J-5 staff, responsible for political military affairs, and later as the Director of Operations at U.S. Forces Command, Fort McPherson, Georgia. He commanded the 25th Infantry Division, 1997 to 1999, and concluded a spectacular career as the Commander-in-Chief of the United States Southern Command, responsible for all operations and diplomacy throughout Central and South America and their contiguous waters. After his retirement, he fielded the Tom Hill or the J.T. Hill Group, a consulting firm in Carl's Gable, Florida. He also serves on the board of United for Columbia, a nonprofit organization providing medical treatment to landmine victims in Columbia, and is a member of the board of trustees of Trinity University. I've known General Hill and his family for over 40 years. He has always been an out front leader, passionate that things be done right, while always ensuring a, a great command climate, one that's conducive to learning and growing of his subordinates, regardless of their age. And deep down, he's a caring leader. He has courage, yet he's savvy. You know, he's a responsible leader with, I think, great breadth and wonderful wisdom. It's interesting that his wife, Tony, is known throughout the armed forces as a leader for military families and their programs, and particularly for military children with disabilities and the challenges that they face. As you know, in this audience, leadership has many facets, some utilitarian, some knowledge-based, some psychological, some behavioral. We often hear people, though, speak of the formal how of leadership. Sometimes I think uh, almost like it can be achieved by following prescribed procedures, a kind of cookbook approach to leadership. There certainly is a place for the theory, but leadership is far more complex if one is to be successful, and I know you know that. There's always an informal aspect that is equally and frankly sometimes can be more important. And that informal aspect of leadership can include mentoring. Mentoring transcends the technical and formal approach to leadership to a very personal relationship between leader and follower based on mutual trust. And this is the topic this evening that journalists Hall said and Hill will discuss along with what I'm sure is very basic, good, solid leadership. Thanks very much for both of you coming today and spending an evening with uh, VMI and, and this audience. Please welcome General Halstead and General Hill. Well, we really appreciate uh, General P giving us this invitation. Um, I, I, for one, leader and residents have had an absolute blast the last three or four days spending time with the cadets, the faculty, the staff, the people behind the scenes. So this evening is about mentorship. So I noticed we both stood up because we both decided during lunch there is no way we're going to be able to sit and talk about this subject because we're too passionate about it. And if we sit in the chair, we'll be too contained. I might fall asleep. Yeah, well, we don't want anybody to fall asleep. <laughs> so it, uh, you know, feel free to get up if you think you're going to fall asleep, right? But we want to talk to you about mentorship. And we specifically asked that we could do this today. We both know that as leaders, our responsibility is to teach, to coach, and to mentor. And a lot of, a lot of leaders have mentored me. I tease that many tormented me also. But many have mentored me. But I didn't choose all my leaders to be my mentor. But I chose General Hill. And I chose him because in simple definition, I believe that a mentor is someone I want to grow up to be like. And it isn't because he was a four star. The first time I worked for him, he was a two star. I was a battalion commander. It was because I saw a man of character and a man of competence. I saw a husband who loved his wife, was loyal, trustworthy. I saw a man who loved his children, who loved his soldiers, and I wanted some of that. And so over time, 
he has mentored me in many, many ways. And so what we thought would be really neat would be that we have a conversation on mentorship, that we invite you into that conversation, so we'll chat a little bit about it between us, and then we know that you are prepared to ask us some of the tough questions and what you want to know about mentorship that we might not have addressed or questioned something that we said. So, sir, you have often told me there are categories of mentors. Yeah. Would you share with them what you mean I by will. that? I will. I will. You know, I, I think that, that uh, Joe Halstead said, you know, a mentor is someone you want to grow up to be like, but not to be. You simply got to be yourself, first and foremost. But I've looked at mentors in three different categories. First off, uh, I have historical mentors, and I'll use my as an example. I have historical mentors, people I read about, people I wanted to emulate. My three historical uh, mentors, first and foremost, uh, President Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Joshua Chamberlain. The Army guys might know Joshua Chamberlain. Many of you don't. Joshua Chamberlain, if the, if the two great strategic leaders of the Civil War were Grant and Lee, and they were, the single greatest, in my opinion, tactical leader of the Civil War was Joshua Chamberlain. He was a rhetoric professor from Bowdoin College in Maine who turns out to be, with no background whatsoever, the hero of the Battle of Little Round Top. And I would submit to you that without Joshua Chamberlain, the, bat the, little, the Battle of Little Round Top could have easily been lost. Had the Battle of Little Round Top been lost, Gettysburg would have been lost, and we could probably be talking about a different society that we live in today. We certainly as a nation could never have fulfilled what we have become had we been uh, belabored by continued slavery. And the Civil War got us out of that. And Joshua Chamberlain and his courage uh, was, was, been, was great in that. And he went on to be a governor of Maine, a Medal of Honor recipient, remarkable human being. You ought to read about Joshua Chamberlain. He's worth emulating. There are mentors uh, that you come across in your life. Uh, General P is one of mine. He talked about, I knew him as a captain. I knew him in the building when I, uh, when I was the aide. He was the executive general with them. Uh, I've watched him, I've listened to him, I have wanted to be like him, I have considered him for many, many, many years uh, my older brother that I did not have. Uh, General Wickham that I was privileged, privileged to be the aide for, he was chief of staff of the army. Uh, very much a father figure to me, a man who helped transform the army both culturally and uh, in material and in thought process and in terms of the unit cap uh, capabilities of the army and showed me that being a man, being a warrior, female or man, you have to let me do generics here for a little bit, does not require screaming and yelling. It doesn't require vulgarity. It requires a little bit of civility. It requires all kinds of things, uh, and he was all of those things. He was about the size of General Halstead, maybe a little bit bigger, but not much. And he was a true warrior in every shape of the word. And I've had several others. Um, but I also have what I call memorial, war, memorial mentors. The first one was a soldier that I had in my platoon in Vietnam, one of my platoons in Vietnam. And I have carried him around with me all of these years. I've forgotten his name a long time ago. Every now and then, though, I see his face as clearly if he was sitting right there. He's dead today because I did not do my job right. I could have done nothing more than shooting myself. He's dead today because I failed. That's a mentor. You carry him around for a long time. The other mentor was a young man as a four-star the first, one of the very first soldiers killed in OIF was a Colombian citizen named Diego Rincon. Specialist for Diego Rincon. I went to his funeral. And at his funeral, his father pinned on me a button with Diego Rincon's face on it, picture. As I presented him, 
Diego Rincon's posthumous U.S. citizenship. I put his picture on my desk in South Tom, and I looked at it every day until I retired to re remind myself that there are consequences to senior level decision making, and Diego Rincon is a consequence. And you got to think about that from now on. Those are my categories. So I would say, you know, it would be really good for you in reflection is to think in those three categories, who would you say are your mentors at this point in your life, at this point of your journey? Because that may change over time. For me personally, historically, it's Corey Ten Boone. You'll have to read the story. If you read the book, The Hiding Place, I'll tell you a little bit about it. First woman to be a, a watchmaker in Holland. Her family hid the Jewish people in their home in Holland so they would not have to go to the concentration camps until they were turned in by their neighbors and then they all went to the concentration camp, and Corrie Ten Boone was the lone survivor out of her family. And today, there's even a tree planted at the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem for Corrie Ten Boone, who ended up living to be 80-some years old, who got out of the concentration camp on a uh, technicality. Why her? Because I don't know about you, but sometimes I know that I have convictions. I know that I have a certain faith that I practice. I know that sometimes I'm in a situation, and I always ask to ask, ask myself, much like, your honor code, maybe your cadet prayer is, will I always choose the harder right over the easier wrong? And I can't think of any other way than someone like Corey Ten Boone. And then much like General Hill, my first soldier killed in Iraq, Sergeant Jim Wachowski, in a complex attack, um, got to become very good friends with his family. I've kept his picture every day. I have his name on my, on my dog tags that contain the names of you know, all the soldiers that were in my, uh, in my command that were killed over there. Um, but I look at him and I just, I remind myself that we must continue to live our lives, lead our lives, but the leadership is about the lead. His life was, he did not lose his life in vain, no matter what you think about the war, and we've had a lot of conversations about that today. I will never ever say that any of my soldiers died in vain. They paid the ultimate sacrifice. But I use him as an example for all other soldiers to remind themselves to live for the country, to live for those values, to not get into a foxhole of why me or what, it, what whatever, because then the enemy always gets a second kill. So Sergeant Jim Murkowski for me falls in that category. So let's switch gears a little bit, because we have men and women in the, in the crowd, and I know you love the male-female question, right? So did you think that you mentored me differently as one of your battalion commanders since I was a woman? No. I, I don't think he did either. And I would tell you that if I thought that he did while well, I was being a battalion commander, sir, I, I, wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have had the same level of respect. No, no I'm, I'm convinced I didn't. We, we, we were talking about this earlier today. Um, to show you where we have come in the United States Army in the, uh, uh, with females, in 1973 at the Infantry Officer Advance Course, when I was a captain, three Army WACs were sent there to join the Infantry Officer Advance Course. Those three women took incredible grief. It's almost indescribable. I became very close friends with one of them, a woman named Pat Hickerson, who went on to become an Army two-star. General Hickerson would have been General Hickerson, male or female. Uh, but she helped transform the Army. But I've been vitally interested in female uh, integration in the Army ever since. I am a firm believer, and, I, and I've tried to practice this, the United States military is a better military because of women in our ranks, not in spite of them. And I firmly believe that. It is that diversity. It is that uh, ability to bring different things to the table, different ways of looking at things. We are better off because of women, not in spite of them. So the answer is, I work real hard at not doing that. And you, and you get it right, sir. You know, and he practices what he preaches, and that's what the value system is all about. And you get a lot of wisdom. I, I believe what General Peter just mentioned, you know, we should talk more about wisdom. But I never heard General Hill say that. So we were in a meeting in South America. I don't remember who was in the room. But most of the people that were in the room with the four-star general usually was like this, the ambassador, secretary of defense for that country, maybe the president for that country, their, their service chief. And uh, we were in a country where they didn't have women in their military. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm taking notes because that's what a good colonel does off to the side. And all of a sudden he says, you know what? Your military would be a lot better off if you had more of them. And he pointed to me, and I was like, oh, God, I better attention. 
Because you're women, and he said the same thing. Your military would be more professional because of women, not in spite of them. Our, that's the way ours is. So I, 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 I believe, sir, that you, you walk the talk. And, um, and, I, never, and I never doubted that. Uh, mentoring mentoring is, a, is, is very vital to what you do uh, as, a, as an officer, as a leader. I'm not, not going to say as an officer, as a leader. Whether you're in industry or whether you're in the military. It is your obligation, your obligation to mentor those around you and those that work for you. I firmly believe that. Stephen Covey had a line that there, the four core needs of human beings are to live, to love, to learn, to leave a legacy. Legacy, my legacy, are the Becky Halsteads of the world. Not what I did in Unit X or anything else. My legacy is her and other people like her that I helped train, that I watched grow, that I helped nurture. His legacy is me. I had, when I, General uh, Peeves mentioned that I had uh, the horse platoon at Fort uh, Hood. The CG at the time was a man named Shoemaker, Bob Shoemaker. He went on to be a four-star general. And every year, the Army Chief of Staff gets the retired four stars together uh, for a day and briefs us and tells us what's going on. And, and it's always a nice little gathering. The last time I saw General Shoemaker at the one, I was sitting there, and, and, and everything, the Army still has a, every military has a pecking order of everything. And there's this U-shaped table, and old guys like General P, they're up here at this top right here. And us young guys are way the hell down here on the end. And, but we can see the screen better. Uh, General Shoemaker picked up his card, his name tape, came down, plopped it down next to me and sat down and grabbed my knee and said, I'm really proud of you. I cannot tell you what that meant to me. It was just marvelous to me. I was his legacy. And you want to leave legacies. You want to, that's what you've got to be about. This is, all this stuff's about people. You can make all the money in the world, and if you haven't touched another soul in a meaningful way, you've wasted your time. You've just wasted your time. And I believe I've tried to live my life trying to make a meaningful difference in some other life. And I always believe, it's a little bit idealistic, I don't I doubt that, but if each one of us, one person at a time, tried to make every day a meaningful difference in just one other life, how much better we'd be. Me making a meaningful difference in your life, you making a meaningful difference in her life, she in his life, all around this room, we could get rid of in this country racial and gender bias and become the nation we should be, not the nation we are. We could do all those things because we are all in this together. And all it takes is people trying to help people. Anyway. And such a great investment. You know, if those of you going to the business world, you're going to go, what's my return on investment? You're going to be business minded. And leadership and all this is about the human dimension. And I, I love the piece you said, sir, about making a difference. And, and, you know, when I lay my head down on my pillow at night, I tell everybody I go through my no regrets drill. When I lay my head down on my pillow at night, can I honestly say I have no regrets with the way I live this day? Is somebody else's life better because I was in it? And is my life better because you were in it? If I can't come up with any scenario throughout the day that I can't, I can't put that in my head, then I haven't lived that day to its fullest potential in my mind. And I really think that the most important piece of, of mentorship, and this is what we both believe, is that legacy is the product of mentorship. I get asked all the time, you know, and sir, we, we, we appreciate your introductions, and you get those introductions and you go, and it could be a little bit of a wow factor, right? You know, the, this or that much responsibility, whatever. But when people ask me, what do I think my greatest contribution was while I was in the military? The answer is always leaving a legacy. I'm proud to be General Hill's legacy, but I'm even more proud that while we were sitting and talking today, I got a text message from Bill Welch, my company commander mm -hmm. that wrote all the songs in Hawaii, and he's retiring tomorrow. And he said, ma'am, I just want to let you know I'm retiring tomorrow, and I just want to let you know in, in my remarks I'm going to be mentioning, you know, that you were my mentor. And I, I say that humbly to you, but it just, it's just to show you how it fits in. So I write him back, and I said, guess where I am, Bill? I am sitting in VMI. I probably shouldn't be writing this text while I'm talking to General Hill. But I, I am sitting at VMI in Colonel Gray's office, with General Hill, and we're going to be talking tonight on mentorship. And, and it just keeps perpetuating itself. And when you see 
Young men and women grow up to be leaders that make great decisions and great choices, and they don't fall from glory because they understand that. You then will create your legacy. And, it, and I think you were talking to someone who's going to be retiring, right? A three star is going to be retiring a, a Bernie Shampoo. Mm. And it's hard to leave. It's hard to retire because all you know, it's your, you know, it's your life. And he told Bernie Shampoo, who I also know because we were peers together, Bernie, don't feel badly about retiring because you've made such a contribution. And for the rest of your life, people are going to come up to you and say, I remember you when, and you did this or that. And this is the joy of leading and the product of leading in terms of mentorship. So should we open up some questions? You got yeah. something you want to say? The only time I can remember, though, anybody ever walking up to me and saying, excuse me, I remember you. I had just left the ranger department. I was a captain. I'm at Fort Hood. And I was an instructor with the ranger department. And this young guy walks up to me, he's a lieutenant, and he says, uh, weren't you at the ranger department a couple of years ago? And I said, I was. And I expected him to say, you were really hard on us, but I appreciate what you do. And he said, well, I just wanted to tell you that I spent my whole time in ranger school saying, if I ever met you again, <laughs> I was going to tell you what a jerk you are <laughs> and uh, that I never want to work for you. And I smiled and I said, you better hope you never work for me. <laughs> but most of the time, people walk up to you and say, hey, I was there. You know, it's a, it's a nice feeling. <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. Well, if you've been an assignments officer in the Army and somebody comes up and says, ma'am, you were my assignments officer, the first thing you wonder is, did I send you to Korea? You know, did I send you? <laughs> right, you know. <laughs> Was this a good thing or a bad thing exactly, we're about to talk about? Exactly. Same, same kind of feeling. Okay, question. Let's open it up. Uh, it's a little hard for us to see, but we would love to take your questions on this very important subject. So wave your hand. Okay, yes, you're in the back. Yes, sir. Ma'am, sir, what do you believe the difference is between being a coach and a mentor? You made that distinction earlier. I just want you to think about it a little bit. I'll give you my answer to that. I can coach you on how to make a good tackle. I can coach you how to uh, run your organization. I can coach you into specific tactics. I cannot mentor you into doing it for the right reason. I cannot mentor you into understanding that it's part of, or I can't coach you. I can, I can mentor you, though, into understanding that what you're doing is a bigger part of the greater good. I can mentor you in, in trying to say to you, look at what I am and what I try to be, and why don't you model that? That's different from coaching. That's how I'd look at it. I totally agree. I mean, it's, it's kind of the how versus the why. You know, you can tell somebody how to do something, but when you get into the why, and we, and we talked about mentoring earlier together over lunch, you know, neither one of us are prescriptive when we mentor people. You know, but we have been mentored by some folks who are very prescriptive. When you mentor, you do your best to give recommendations based on what you know, and you're kind of looking at the strategic picture, you, you, you're developing that person. But coaching for me is a little more tactical, it's a little more prescriptive. Yeah. So. I don't know where I heard this, but I really what? like it as a phrase, and it gets right to this coaching versus mentoring. The person that knows the why of anything will always outdo the person who knows the how. Yeah. It's the bigger piece of it. It's, it is what begins to separate junior officers from senior officers, from general officers. It is that ability to see beyond the immediate. Yes, I know how to pack my rucksack. But yes, I know what I'm going to do with the stuff that's in my rucksack. And I know why we're going to do with the stuff that's in my rucksack. And there's a big difference in all that. Who else? OK, yes, ma'am. Yeah, Baker, you will talk about class 2 expertise. Questions for both of you. Um, I wanted to know if there was ever a time when you regretted, uh, I guess, a mentorship moment and how it may have influenced you as a leader. Uh, regretted in a, in a moment where I mentored someone or someone mentored me? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, no, when you mentored someone. Okay. Um, i got to think about that. I can think of someone really early. You got, you got an answer for that right off the top of your head, sir? Uh, um, no, but I'm going to... Uh, let me think about that. Um, That's a very good question. It, it really is. Because it, it, it makes us pause and think about something. I'll give you one example. An example of something I regret to this moment. When I was uh, a senior in high school, um, the 
freedom riders went down into the deep south uh, to uh, volunteer to encourage people to get out to vote. Three of them were killed. Uh, Schwaney, Schweitzer, and uh, Fred. Uh, I had thought about, when I graduated from high school, I wanted to go do that. I had really thought about doing that. Uh, I talked myself out of it. I regret to this day I did not do it. Um, it. It was one of those moments that you, that, that you uh, and, I, and I had been mentored by some people to do that, and I regret to this day that I did not. Does that get at a little bit of what you're saying? See, I think most of the time for me the regret has been when I did not mentor and I should have. You know, I was too busy, I, I wasn't approachable, I wasn't available, and I didn't take the time to do it. I think that's a greater gr regret for me with mentorship than, you know, because I, I think I saw at a very young age very good role models for what mentoring should be and what mentoring should not be. So I will give you an example of, as an aide de camp to a three-star general, um, I picked up the phone one day and one of my peers, another captain, was on the phone and he wanted to speak to the three-star general. So I patched him through. And I could tell what they were talking about because we always kept the door open so I had good situational awareness. And they were talking about his next promotion, his next assignment, and the boss was giving him very specific guidance. About three weeks later, John calls again on the phone. I said, John, hold one second, uh, hold one second. And I said, sir, John's on the phone. He said, I'm not taking the phone call. I was like, this is an awkward moment, okay. All right, very good, sir. I, so I said, uh, hey, John, the, the boss isn't available right now. I'll get back with you, I'll, I'll talk to you later, hung up. So I go in and see my three star and I said, sir, he said, if he ever calls back again for guidance and mentoring, I'm not available because he did not take my guidance. So for me, that was a lesson on how not to mentor, right? Be only because I think that when you come to me, you're looking for maybe some guidance and some recommendations and I'm investing in you, but I will never know everything about your situation, personally or professionally. So I'm there to share my wisdom, but when I met, anytime I mentor someone, I say, you have no requirement to come back and tell me what your final decision was, you know? But I hope this helps you make the best decision or the best action. Yeah. So I, I gave an example of what it, I don't think it should look like, but um, it sure helped me, right, to do it better, I think. The so better person to ask that question would be someone that we had failed to men mentor that they knew that they, we had failed to mentor. Yeah. And for whatever reason, I don't know. And, I, and that's, a, that's a good way to look at that. You know, the other thing was um, what uh, General Halstead mentioned about, uh, uh, yeah, I didn't take my guidance, so I'm not going to ever talk to him again. I hate this phrase about, well, you asked my opinion, but then you don't do it, so I'm not going to give you my opinion. Excuse me. I want your opinion. I want you to come to me as a teammate and talk to me about things, and I'll listen to your opinion. Just because you gave me an opinion doesn't mean I have to do it. I just put it in there with the equation with everybody else's, and what you said may have been stupid. Uh, but, 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 but as, a, as a junior officer, as a senior officer, you've got to continue listening. You've got to continue trying to get people to talk to you. You are joining, if you go into the military, you're joining the greatest team sport there is. And in order to do that, you've got to play with your teammates. You guys, have, you guys and gals, I always use guys, it's a very generic term with me. You guys have been learning that here at Mary Baldwin in ways that you'll never understand until you're out there 10, 15 years from now. This is part of you now, and that's good for the nation. Sometimes you will be mentored and you don't like what they tell you. It doesn't mean it's wrong, right? So I, I went up for one of my counselings with General Hill, and he said, Becky, not a lot of time. Keep doing what you're doing. Then they all, but... If there's one thing I could tell you to do, it would be to be a little less defensive. Less defensive, sir? What do you mean less defensive? <laughs> I didn't quite do it like that. My head did that, though, right? Like, what does he mean, less defensive? And I love General Hill because I think also as a mentor, you need to know, and as a leader, you know, let people figure it out. Let them go think about it. And he said, Becky, go think about it. I was a battalion commander, by the way. I walk back down to my office, and I'm thinking, oh, man, I feel a little disappointed because... The boss has a perception, a perception that I'm defensive would be the last thing that I would want him to have a perception of. But if he does, there must be a reason why. And I'm thinking, I'm not defensive. I'm passionate. I have a lot of energy. I get excited about what I do. But what I realized was 
when the boss would ask me questions, I would get maybe, I would get excited. I would maybe start to talk a little faster. And sometimes that's not always well received. You know, I, when I'm in the corporate world speaking, I said, you know, can you imagine a, a man asks a woman a question and she starts getting really excited to go, I don't know what I asked her, but please remind me never to ask her, her again, right? But here's, here's the beauty of the story. I learned that whether I was defensive or not, the fact that it was the perception meant I needed to make a change. Because if the boss stops listening to me, I have lost my vote. And when I lose my vote as a leader, I lose the vote of the people that I lead behind me. And the greatest value of that whole thing was when I was in Iraq and I saw some of the leaders who worked for me who were passionate about what they did. My senior colonel for explosive ordnance disposal, IEDs on the battlefield. He loved what he did, but he was so intense and he was so passionate that when he would go into the three and four star to talk about what we were going to do on the battlefield, they got turned off. And so he lost his vote. And if General Hill at that particular time did not do this with me, I don't think I would have recognized it so that I could pull that colonel aside and say, Dave, you're too defensive. Let's work this out because you're losing your vote. So sometimes you get mentored. You might not totally like it, but you need to ask yourself, does it apply? One of the things I've learned over time is I learned it as a major in the building for the first time I was in the Pentagon. And one of the things, and it's kept me in good stead for a long time, there are no facts. There are no facts. When I tell you something and I get you to buy into it, that's a fact. Otherwise, it's an opinion. Look at Congress today. There are no facts. Everybody's right on both sides. And you've got to be able to work your way beyond that. Uh, I mentioned earlier one of my great mentors was General Wickham, Chief Staff of the Army. And one day we were at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and, I, and it was just, back in those days, it was just kind of us. We didn't have these huge entourages that I had when I was traveling around Halstead and all those people. But um, I picked up the phone right before breakfast, and General Wickham was sitting there, and somebody said something to me, and I ripped this guy up on the other end of this phone. Something awful. And I remember hanging it up and looking at General Wickham, and he looked at me, and I could tell that he was not pleased what he had just heard. He was an unhappy camper with me. He didn't say anything. That afternoon, we're running. And uh, we're running along, and he says, uh, you know, Tom, you really are a good aide, and you are a great officer. He said, but if I could give you one bit of advice. And I said, yes, sir. He said, you need to learn to suffer fools more gladly. And I went, wow. And I've tried, and I said, well, you know, I'm really trying to do that. Well, he says, work harder at it. <laughs> I really took that on board, and I tried to do that, all, especially the higher you go up, because you can really wound people with words in ways that you have no idea uh, that you have. And, and, the, and, the, and part of the obligation of a leader is because you are here and everybody's below you does not mean that you can demean them through your words because they have no opportunity to fight back. It's bullying of the worst kind. And you really have to, to work at that. And the higher you go up and the higher you, you got to really work at keeping things in perspective, uh, you'll, you, you have to really work at that. And I, and I remember, and he, had a, he is wonderful. I would, he, I would sit in on meetings and some general would say something, and it would be the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. And General Wickham would say, well, you know, General Hall said, that's a really decent idea, but maybe if we go, and he would turn it all around and it'd all go off. And he really had a way of doing that in a nice way and still getting everything done. Anyway, who else? Who else? Sir? Yes, sir. This is Raymond Williams, be my class of 2018. As a youth, in both of your lives, you've seen a numerous you know, amount of mentors, you know, all different. Is there a certain characteristic that all seem to universally have that makes them stand out as a mentor and makes you willing to listen to their advice and your life? For me, yes, absolutely. Um, so one of the things we mentioned is, you know, um, mentorship. You know, you don't have to. You, you don't only mentor people that look like you, that act like you, 
Um, nor do you choose mentors like that, right? And, and that you have to be very careful about that because there are women who think that they should only mentor women and you know, and you can then do the uh, different races and whatever. It shouldn't be that way. Matter of fact, I don't even think that a mentor necessarily has to outrank you. One of my, one of my uh, sergeant majors was one of my mentors because he was a naturalized citizen from Ecuador and he loved our nation and he cried like a baby when he showed me his little U.S. flag in his office that an eight-year-old girl gave him on the day that he became a U.S. citizen as a special force. So for me, when I sit and think about who my mentors are, the top two things, character and confidence. Probably the next two, which is the whole focus of this week, honor and service. That it's not about themselves, that it's about others. But it's about others in an honorable and respectful way because it's about the soul. You know, we were talking today at lunch and I said, you know, it's like you, you just reach out, you look through people's eyes and you see their soul or you don't see a soul, you know? And for my mentors, that's what I love, you know, that they, they help me bring that out in myself and bring it out in others. But for me, that's it. Yeah, I would say that if there was one single word to describe the mentors I look for, it would be caring. Did they really care for me? Did they care about what they were doing? The Army's got seven values and we've always said, that the values are all equal, and, uh, and I think that's all bull. Uh, there is one single value that supersedes all of the rest of them, and all of them from this value derive down, and it's called selfless service. If you are about selfless service, you're going to be doing good things. You may be stumbling around, but you're doing it for the right reason. And I could walk you through a whole bunch of examples of people I work, not, not that many, thank goodness, who were not selfless service, but selfish servers. Mm. And they get people killed, and they make bad decisions for the country. Who else? I saw other hands. Yes. Haley Crowderman, BMF class 2018. Um, I'm just curious, in all of your time as high upper leaders or even lower, of all the people that you've had the opportunity to mentor, have you ever found anyone that was unmentorable or unmentorable? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. She had a battalion commander in her brigade that was without question the most mediocre person I've ever been around. He was with, you couldn't talk to him about anything. And I would go over to his battalion and I'd see what was going on and it would be awful. And I'd tell my aide, my, I said, drive me over to Halstead's battalion. I want to see something going on good. So we drive over there. But there are people like that. And what you've got to do is figure out a way to get rid of them. Uh, and I promise you, in business, it becomes fairly simple. In the military, it is not that simple. And, uh, and you've got to do it. I had, uh, and I didn't get rid of this guy. Uh, I eventually uh, sent him on his way and thought I had destroyed him with an OER. Incredibly enough, he didn't. I mean, I, I must have written some great OERs because this guy even got promoted. God knows why. But anyway, <laughs> it, it, I regret that to this day that I got, somehow I got that guy promoted. Anyway, um, I had two or three, only one absolutely uh, issue that was absolutely irrevocable to me. You could, you could or not irrevocable. It was the only constant of anything I did as a leader, and that was this. If you lied to me, you were gone, period. And if you worked for me, and, and Becky and I talked about this today, if you worked for me, I promise you, from the first time I heard this statement until the day I retired, and I heard it as a captain, if you worked for me and you, were, uh, you heard this from me in the first two days because I wanted to make sure you understood it, and it was from one of my heroes in life, a man named Julius Becton. General Becton uh, was one of the pioneers of the United States Army, African American. Absolutely an incredible man of whom I have enormous respect. And he was the first Cav Division commander, and I was a captain on one of the brigade staffs. And he came down, and years later I went to him and I said, uh, I said, this is how I remember this story. Did I get it right? And he said, oh, absolutely. He sat there and he said, he says, I take your word as an officer, period. You tell me that something is something, it is. You tell me the sky is green, it is green. He said, and I'll probably walk outside to see the phenomenon, to check it out. 
but I will do so based upon you told me it was, I went to go see it. And he said, and I will continue to take your word for as long as you are, you are around me until I ever find out, excuse me, that you knowingly or willfully lied to me. Key phrase. Knowingly, willfully lied to me, and then I will take whatever steps are necessary to ensure you never get the chance or the opportunity to lie to me again. I fired two people in almost 37 years in the Army, both of them for lying to me. Why do I say that? The United States military is, has to be built on a foundation of trust. You must trust your soldiers. They must trust you. And when that trust begins to get eroded, it is irrevocably eroded. Irrevocably eroded. Uh, I mentioned earlier Joshua Chamberlain. Joshua Chamberlain at the Battle of Little Round Top, long, short, long story shorter, has, he, he's about to run out of ammunition. It's the last charge of the day by Longstreet's Confederates. He has his lieutenants. He comes, brings them all together. He says, we're out of ammunition. Have everybody fix bayonets. And we're going, to, we're going to do this movement. And he begins to describe a movement that they've never trained for because they haven't trained for it because he's inventing it on the spot. We're going to do this movement, go back and tell your guys how to do it, and we're going to charge into the enemy. And they do it. And they rout the Longstreet's guys, and the Battle of Little Round Top is won. Next day is Pickett's Charge. It's anticlimactic. Um, Gettysburg is won. Why does that happen? That happens because Joshua Chamberlain trusted his lieutenants to do what he told them to do. And his lieutenants and his men trusted that Chamberlain was correct and that he was doing it for the right reasons. So when you, when you lie, in my view, the bond of trust that you and I have together, soldier to soldier, officer to officer, is irrevocably severed. Two people. And I did it instantly when I knew they'd lied to me. And we had not another word of discussion. When we get out of my office, they were done. So I think the inverse of that too, sir, is that we have to be very honest with people who, I'll use your word, unmentorable. Yeah. Um, that you have to sit down and say, you gotta tell them like it is, you know? Um, not ignore that fact. And we would, we would tell you that you, you spent a certain amount of time investing in them and then you realize they can, it can kind of suck you dry and you gotta go cut off, let me, let's, let's have this conversation and say, this is probably not gonna work out for you and this is maybe not the right career or whatever. And then there are others who, they want everybody to be their mentor. I had one young captain uh, in the 25th who I, I, I realized he was asking everybody, you know, going around asking all the senior leaders in the battalion and the brigade the same question and getting their mentorship, right? So I brought them in, I said, Matt, mentoring is not a poll. You know, you don't ask 10 people and take eight out of 10 said I should do whatever. When you want to be mentored, you go to someone that you trust, you value their wisdom, and you know, and, and that way, you know, they're gonna want to invest in you. So you can also be uh, a little over, you know, on, on the other side of that. But I think we have time for one more question. Uh, was, eight, was it 8.35, uh, Dave, that you told me? Okay, so let's go for one more question. Yes, sir. Sir, ma'am, that Janowski. Uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the BMI cadre system, but they're tasked with uh, technical training for the new class, but also to mentor the new class, to show them what the ideal cadet should be. Do you have any advice on how a cadre member should, at the same time, provide technical lesson, yeah, I mean, a tough lesson to teach, hard love, tough love, but at the same time, Well, I, I think actually General Hill alluded to it earlier, and that is to um, like to never be demeaning. Because I, you know, I, I was a new cadet at West Point. I was a few times I felt like I was on the end of demeaning. Okay, uh, but I always say it's okay to be demanding, but never demeaning. So if you're that cadre bringing someone in new, never apologize for high standards. But it, the first thing is it starts with you being the standard when you're standing in front of them to teach them 
all that tactical piece. What what right look like? What right what right looks like starts with you. So when they're, when you're when you're teaching, you're coaching, and you're mentoring them, they ought to be looking at what right looks like. Now the mentoring piece is a little bit more of the arm around the shoulder kind of thing, right? I always said leadership is, is uh, you know, the difference between a pat in the back and a kick in the butt is only eight to ten inches, and you got to be able to give both, right? So, um, so although you're teaching them tactically certain things, you, to me, when you get into the mentoring piece, it is the reason why you want to get this right is because someday you want to be a junior, you know, what all your classes, right? The, the, I'm so yearling. Uh, cow in uh, first year in my head, but um, you want to get to the next year. You want to graduate. You want to be a VMI grad. So to me, when you get into the mentoring piece, it is, it goes back to the why. Here's what you're doing in this coaching, tactical, get it right standard piece, and the reason why is because someday you want that ring on your finger. You want to be a VMI grad. You want to be known as a person uh, with this great honor code and everything else. So I guess that's kind of how I would answer that question. I couldn't add anything to that. Well, in that case, we got no. We don't. It's eight thirty-six. Okay, with all the with all can, the, sir, please. You, oh, you're going to get, do the first thing first. You do the the Kindle I, thing, and then let me finish. Absolutely, yes, okay. right. Because we do okay. want uh, we, yeah. we like General Hill to kind of close out. Uh, he's got something. I do have a little rank here. I'm going to have the last word. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. So, um, would all the uh, would all the cadets who ask the question please stand up? All the cadets that ask the question, all the people that ask the question, please stand up. So I would like the rest of you to give them a round of applause because I thought they asked great questions and they asked them. <laughs> and General Hill subliminally told me that I believe that you had the best question. So if you would come forward, ma'am. Absolutely. Good because choice. Because when you ask someone a question and they don't know the answer, you've asked a profound question that's caused us to think a little harder, a little stronger, a little deeper about what mentorship is. And uh, so she wins a Kindle. I don't know which one, paper white. <laughs> so thank you, great question, okay? For many years, if I am in a group, especially with junior people in it, uh, and we're having this kind of discussion, I want to close with uh, a couple of points. If you remember nothing else out of this evening, if you'll take some of this home with you, I will not have wasted my time. I don't know about you. One of the great heroes of the United States Army's very unsung hero was Matthew Ridgway. He is, in fact, the hero of the Korean War. Succeeded, he succeeded uh, a VMI graduate uh, as the commanding general of the Korean War. He was a very soft-spoken man, and when he retired out of being chief of staff, he went away to his farm in Pennsylvania and uh, never kibitzed or went on television talking heads and stuff. Brilliant man, one of the really unsung heroes. One of the things he said was, he said, you know, soldiers are romantics. They carry around with them in their pockets and in their wallets and now in their purses little scraps of paper that mean something to them, a poem, a something, and they carry it around with them and periodically take it out and read it. They really are romantics. I carry around in my wallet two things. I talked earlier about wanting to make a meaningful difference in someone else's life. I found a better way of saying that by a man named Leo Rostin. And Mr. Rostin says, I cannot believe that the purpose of life is to be happy. I think the purpose of life is to be useful, to be responsible, to be compassionate. It is above all to matter, to count, to stand for something, to have made some difference that you've lived at all. That are words to live by. And how do you do that? Because you follow, in my view, this one, the second thing I'm going to read to you. The week after Martin Luther, and I mentioned earlier that Martin Luther King was one of my, is one of my personal heroes. The week after Martin Luther King was assassinated, Newsweek magazine ran a 
full ep, uh, edition on him. And I found something in there. And if you could see this piece of paper that I laminated years ago, you would see that it has four marks across it. Because I cut it out of that Newsweek magazine in 1969. And I put it in my wallet. And every now and then, over time, I have taken it out at weird moments. And I have read it. And I have tried to rededicate my life to it. Cowardice asks the question, is it safe? Expediency asks the question, is it politic? Vanity asks the question, is it popular? But conscience asks the question, is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but he must take it because conscience tells him that it is right. Those are words to, to bank your life on. Thua, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Sir, ma'am, you've shared some great insights and exciting insights into coaching, mentoring, and a, your collective wisdom has inspired us to make a difference every day. So on behalf of the superintendent and the Corps of Cadets, please accept this small token of gratitude Thank for you, sharing that wisdom. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. And then you can go. Thank you. Thanks.